Good morning everybody and welcome to SMM227 and the first lecture of our series which looks at the module handbook and the dissertation proposal itself and what the composition of that is. So this first uh, session is very much an overview of the entire dissertation and um, what's required from a, a, a UEL perspective as well in terms of the delivery. So today's lecture will focus upon the dissertation structure. So what does a dissertation look like, how many um, chapters are involved and how many words per chapter. We're going to discuss maybe the importance of, of, of attending these sessions as well and what these particular sessions can provide to you in terms of preparation for this particular uh, for this particular piece of work. Um, and in the second half of the, of the uh, lecture, moving away a little bit from the actual dissertation itself to looking at the student and supervisor responsibilities. So what should a supervisor expect from you and what should you actually expect from your, your supervisor? We're going to talk very briefly as well about the UEL regulations in terms of what's required and um, the, uh, the structure of the process and how many um, attempts each student will receive. And finally, the components of a dissertation proposal. So the dissertation proposal is the very first stage of the research process, but what's required for the dissertation proposal, um, how you should approach it, and how you can get started. So, to begin, um, so sometimes students are um, a bit curious as to what a dissertation proposal, or sorry, what a dissertation actually looks like, and what are the various chapters and how many um, words per chapter. Um, the very first uh, section of the dissertation is an abstract, and this is just a 250-word summary of the entire dissertation. Okay, so this gives us an overview of the uh, topic, the uh, literature that's consulted, the methodology that's employed, the key findings and the key recommendations. So this is just a 250 word paragraph snapshot of what is required. The very first chapter is the introduction chapter. Now sometimes it can be slightly deceiving when we think about introduction. We may sometimes think, oh yeah, this is, the introduction is something that we, we will write first. I think it's no harm for students to attempt the introduction chapter first, but generally speaking, I ask my, my own students to write the introduction chapter last, because I very much adopt the Howard Becker philosophy that you don't really understand what you're going to introduce until you've written it. So the introduction chapter is a quick overview of the entire dissertation, and indeed an introduction to the topic. But I'll explain each chapter in a bit more detail as the uh, session progresses. The second chapter really forms the theoretical grounding for the dissertation, which is the literature review. Okay, So that comprises roughly 3,500 words and the introduction chapter 1,500. The research methodology chapter is roughly 2,500 words and it gives us an overview of the research methods that are employed, the philosophy guiding the research, the research questions, the approach, data collection and analysis, and how, da and how data was interpreted and the trustworthiness, reliability and ethics associated with that process. The data analysis chapter is really the main body of the report and this comprises 4,500 words, giving us an overview of what the key findings actually were and how they relate to the research question. The final two chapters then are the conclusions chapter, which is 1,000 words, which gives us a, an overview of the key conclusions of the research, what was the answer to the research question, and how does this uh, research contribute to our understanding of the theoretical topic. And finally, the recommendations chapter, which is 1,000 words. And this gives us um, recommendations for theory, recommendations for practice, and recommendations for future research. So ov overall, this is the structure of a UEL dissertation, and all our dissertations have this structure, and you should use this as a, as a template or as an overview for your work on how it develops. Sometimes there's a sense for, for students to actually wonder about how much time is devoted to each chapter because 
Um, I always tell my students the dissertation is more of a sprint than a marathon. It, it, it's roughly 12 to 14 weeks and you should try and apportion your time appropriately around how much each chapter will take and the, re the requirements for each chapter. So what we, the, the kind of broad overview of, of, of time allocation for each particular chapter is the introduction chapter will probably take you somewhere between five and seven days. So we apportion roughly a week to that particular chapter. The literature review is a major piece of work and that takes roughly three weeks because you've got to go to the library, you've got to look at what's been written before, what the key conversation in the field is, and actually write that up into a coherent narrative. So that takes roughly three weeks. The methodology, which kind of gives us an overview of what you've done and how you've done it and how you've actually gone about analysing your data, is roughly two weeks of work, between, um, between two and 2.5 weeks. The data collection and data analysis process, which is collecting your data, analysing it, interpreting it, making sense of it, and drafting that up into a 4,500 word uh, maximum sort of chapter, um, is roughly three weeks, although that, that can sometimes vary. It can, it can take um, a little bit longer sometimes. The conclusions and recommendations chapter should take roughly about a week each, okay? Although sometimes if the data analysis is, is, is taking a bit longer, they can, can be compacted into a single week. So again, this is um, not necessarily, these are more rules of thumb than, you know, absolutes that you must follow in your research. And you've got to devise a timetable with your supervisor that makes the most sense in terms of how you deliver this, uh, this piece of work. And finally, you shouldn't discount how long it will take to actually um, to do your abstract, but mostly to edit and to reference and to proofread your document. And that can certainly take a week to actually have the document looking professional, uh, to have it looking um, like a, a, a scholarly academic piece of work. So that's roughly the 12 week timetable and what it will take you to actually um, design this piece of work. So what is a dissertation and what what constitutes a dissertation and what differentiates it from something that is maybe a, a, an essay or a report? Well, crucially, a dissertation is an independent research project, okay? So it in some way uh, evaluates scholarship in a particular area on a key topic and develops a, a, a research question. And when we develop a research question, we're asking a question that in some way moves beyond our own experiences of that topic and actually um, critically engages with the, uh, with, the, with the literature and develops a, a valid and appropriate research question. What's very important then is that the student will conduct a, um, a research project that collects um, primary and or secondary data. So primary data is a research that a student will generate him or herself, or secondary data drawing upon data that already exists, that was collected for another purpose but can be drawn upon specifically for the purposes of the dissertation. Um, crucially for a dissertation, it must answer a question. So the question must be formulated from engagement with the literature. Um, it must have a, a, a the, the dissertation must have a clear set of question, a, a, a clear research question and or related objectives to that question. And at the end, the student must answer that question and have a clear thesis, which is grounded within the findings. So the thesis is the clear argument that emerges from your, your dissertation, okay? For example, one of my students recently con conducted a dissertation looking at brand um, relationship dissolution and found that there were numerous factors that led to that and she had a very clear thesis as to what those factors were and how they contributed towards uh, relationship dissolution. So this is really a, what a dissertation process, uh, so what a dissertation project comprises of. But I also think it's important to distinguish or differentiate between what is a dissertation, which is the independent research project that has engagement with the literature, has a question, adopts a methodology and answers a question, to something that maybe does not look like a dissertation. So just to give you that clear distinction. It's not a 14,000 word essay, okay, because it's a process. And each chapter contributes towards 
um, addressing the, the, the research topic in some way. So it is a staged process and it's very important to think of it as a process. Um, a, dis, um, a project that doesn't have an appropriate theoretical grounding. So, for example, a project that doesn't have critical engagement with a key area of scholarship in the literature. Okay? So that is not a dissertation because it doesn't have adequate theoretical grounding. Um, a project that doesn't have a valid research question. So it's very important for the student to actually take the time to design a research question that shows engagement with the literature and addresses some perhaps gap in the literature, okay, or something that requires further research. A dissertation project that does not have any data cannot be considered a dissertation. Okay? So by data we mean engagement with qualitative, quantitative, um, primary data, or some sort of secondary data analysis. So there has to be some data component to the dissertation. And finally, a project that doesn't have a clear thesis, doesn't really um, have a clear uh, finding or clear um, uh, set of analysis that actually addresses the question in some sort of a focused way. So without having a clear thesis or a clear argument emerging from the work. So when we look at the dissertation as a process, it's important for us to embed that within the stages of, um, the, stages of the research process and look at what are the different component parts of the research process. And the research process in social science and in science generally tends to follow six key stages. And the first stage is to identify a valid research topic. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the second half of this session, which is how do we actually go about formulating a research topic? How do we go about choosing a particular uh, topic that's relevant to the discipline we are studying? Once we engage with the topic, Topic and we look at the literature in a particular area and we read it and we engage with it, then we have to think about what research questions can we ask, okay? So what sort of uh, questions emerge from our engagement with the literature? Are there any gaps? Is there anything that we could address? And we frame that as a question or a set of objectives that are relevant to the topic, okay? We then determine how we're going to answer that question and that can be addressed through qualitative methods such as interviews, focus groups, uh, ethnographic, ethnography or case study research or it could be more quantitative based, survey based research or secondary data analysis looking at financial data from Bloomberg for example or designing our own case study. So we have to determine exactly what methodology we will use to actually address the question question that we have set from our engagement with the literature. Once we determine how we're going to collect our data, we have to actually go about collecting the data. So we have to actually go about physically gathering that information, gathering that knowledge through uh, focus, as I said, through um, whether qualitative, quantitative or, 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 or indeed mixed methodology. Then, once we've collected the data, it's our job to analyze, interpret it, and make sense of it, and try to answer the research question in a focused way, and then finalize the thesis, which is the answer to the question that we have posed. So the first chapter is the introduction, and I've given a, a broad overview, but I think this section will just go into a little bit more depth as to what each uh, chapter should contain. So the introduction chapter is the origin of the research question. So where did the interest in this particular topic actually emerge from? And considering the key facts that surround the research context. So if this is a uh, study of social network, social networking behavior, for example, the reader may, may expect to see something that gives us an overview of that context. So, for example, if it's about Facebook, telling us something about the uh, number of students who use Facebook or the number of people who use Facebook or uh, how consumers are using Facebook for different sorts of identity projects, etc. So, it's giving us some uh, facts around in the context. Crucially in your introduction chapter, the student should introduce the uh, research question and objective. So what are the parameters of this project? Um, what are the uh, key question, what is the key question and related objectives that are uh, at the heart of this project? 
And often this is the first chapter that your supervisor or indeed your ex uh, examiner will read. So they'll often look and say, well, what is this dissertation about? What are the key um, question or stroke objectives that are, dr are uh, driving this project? And finally, in the introduction chapter, the student will give us an overview of the structure. So it will explain the literature review and what its key uh, focus is, the methodology that was employed, the data analysis and, and the key findings, the key conclusions of the research, and the recommendations for theory, for practice, and for future research. So this is basically giving us a, an entree. It sets the scene for the whole project, and it gives us an overview as to what the entire project is about. The critical literature review is um, again about 3,500 words and it gives us uh, an overview of the conversation that's happening and what I often say to students is that um, uh, academics have conversations with each other about topics formally through journals. So they research their topics, they develop key findings, and they contribute parts of knowledge towards what's called the body of knowledge. And it's the student's responsibility to look at that conversation in the journals and try and critically moderate this conversation. What's been written previously? What is the expert opinion in this area? And students crucially have to try and present an argument which critically evaluates that scholarship and to try and position them themselves within it. So they have a clear understanding, a clear evaluation, and they have a, a clear understanding of what the, what the key components of the argument in the literature actually is. And if students can do this at MSc level, it's quite valuable to try and think about what gaps exist in the literature, what further research can be done, what sort of studies would contribute towards further understanding. And a cru crucial area where students will find this understanding is usually in the sections of um, journal articles at the very end or towards the very end, which are called suggestions for future research. And we can often find valuable, important insights in those sections that give us ideas of ways in which we could develop um, other studies, more qualitative, more quantitatively orientated, or related theoretical tangents that would be very valuable for our, uh, for, for our purposes. So the critical literature review is vital because it theoretically positions the work and what we are doing. The research question is so vital, and I, and I know it may seem like I'm overemphasizing it, but it really is what Jennifer Mason describes as the essence of your inquiry. And it's very important for a research question to actually be a sentence that's phrased in such a way as to elicit information. So it has to be a question, it cannot be a statement. Okay. Uh, it requires a lot of thought because the student has to think about what's been written before, what they can contribute towards that conversation and how crucially they're going to phrase that particular question. Um, sometimes, but not all the time, it's useful if there's a specific gap in the literature, something that can be contributed towards, something that will be valuable in terms of a, a future study. And from that question, students can then develop more uh, focused objectives that can help them to uh, further illuminate the, uh, the research question and the context. So the question is vital. I want to show you as well just some examples of questions that have been successful. And these questions, these research questions have, are all based on dissertations that I personally have supervised. And these have all either, in, either received a distinction or, or a high merit. So these are all questions that are academically valid, that are useful, um, and that are um, well framed and well, well thought out. So for example, what value do online communities create for their users? So looking at value very much from a consumption perspective. Uh, what are consumer experiences of the Abercrombie and Fitch brandscape? Okay, so that's looking at consumer uh, brand experience, store experience, and how that contributes towards enhanced consumer brand relationships. Um, quite an interesting um, dissertation that was done last summer from a Chinese student of mine, looking at the factors that led to the dissolution of consumer brand relationships. So what actually forces, or not forces so much, but um, leads to relationships um, diminishing or, or uh, in, in, in some way dissolving between consumers and their brands. 
And finally, um, from an advertising perspective, really interesting piece of work from a couple of years back looking at the Dove campaign for real beauty. So looking at how did consumers interpret the Dove campaign for real beauty and what sort of uh, you know, uh, con you know, consumer insights could be gained from looking at the reading of text, the reading of advertisements. So that is, they are examples of questions that are well framed and, and well formed. And in, in terms of how you read the literature, you should, from reading the literature, develop a research question that it will enable you to you know, uh, design a study where you can collect data, address that question and contribute towards the conversation crucially in some way. Um, the methodology is also vitally important and in the methodology you have key components. You have a statement of the research question and objectives. It's almost like a restatement. It's reminding the reader of what the, what the key focus of this research is. The research philosophy which uh, outlines what are the um, ontological, epistemological and uh, axiological assumptions that underlie the methodology that you've employed. And in the research philosophy section we'll go into a little bit more about philosophy and how that can guide inquiry in social science. Um, the student then explains the design of the research, so what sort of uh, approach has been taken, how has the study been designed, and crucially, what is the rationale and justification for designing the study in that particular way. Uh, the student will then explain how the data was collected, sampling strategy, if it's qualitative or quantitative research, can, can be very helpful and can explain to us exactly how the student collected the data and who he or, whom he or she spoke to. Uh, explaining as well the data analysis and interpretation procedures. So how is the data analyzed and interpreted and how does that, um, how, how is that process actually um, uh, incorporated in practice. And finally, the student will explain some validity, reliability, or as sometimes we call in qualitative research, trustworthiness. So how does the student um, try to ensure that their analysis of the data is valid and is reliable and can be, um, you know, can be relied upon uh, academically? And finally, research ethics, which explains the ethical implications of the data collection and how this uh, impacted upon the, the research process. Crucially then, um, we have different approaches and our students at, uh, at um, the business school tend to use a variety of different approaches that are useful. For example, in-depth interviewing is very common amongst a lot of uh, students using qualitative methods. Focus groups are not used so much anymore and you don't really see an awful lot of social scientific research drawing upon them, but particularly for uh, advertising studies looking at, you know, one of my students recently looked at road safety and looked at how consumers interpreted road safety ads and focus groups were very appropriate for that. Ethnographic and netnographic re research methods are also used by our students. Um, ethnographic research is, it tends to be used more for PhD work, but it's still, we, some of our students use elements of ethnography, which is observing and participating in the activities of everyday life. Um, but increasingly what a lot of our students are using is netnography, which is the application of ethnographic principles, as in observing and participating in everyday life, to online computer mediated social interaction. So netnographic research has become quite common and a lot of our students look at online behavior from a netnographic perspective. Case studies are um, always very illuminating and there are methodologies associated with looking at case studies and indeed John Chandler, one of our um, uh, a reader in our school, has contributed a session towards this particular series looking at case studies and how they can be written and developed. But often they take a look at uh, business cases and uh, collect qualitative, quantitative or secondary data to develop um, an understanding of the case of a particular organization or institution and they can be very valuable. From a quantitative perspective, questionnaires are used a lot by our students. So these are questionnaires um, of either business people or consumers or key stakeholders uh, that address a particular topic in the literature and questionnaires have become very uh, 
well, not have become, but they have always been very important in social science. But our students use them quite regularly, and, and they, they are quite valuable in terms of being a useful research instrument. And finally, secondary data analysis sources. So this could be analyzing data that's generated from Bloomberg, for example, from um, financial reports, from um, uh, reports, for example, from Mintel that have been produced for different purposes, and actually incorporating them into the analysis. So primary and secondary data are used quite frequently for the, for the dissertation data collection. The data analysis chapter is almost, it's really important. It's the one of the key chapters and it's 4,500 words so it is particularly uh, heavy. But the analysis of key patterns within the data, whether that's qualitative, quantitative or secondary data, okay? Um, looking for emergent themes and within those patterns, okay, so how can the research be um, uh, the research question be addressed, what key themes are emerging, what patterns are emerging, um, if it's a quantitative sort of survey based research, what sort of hypothesis uh, has, what sort of hypothesis has been tested and what has the result of that hypothesis testing actually been. Key, crucially it's looking at the dominant findings, so what did you seek to find out and what did you actually find out. And really comparing and contrasting your findings with what you analysed in the literature review. So the, the key themes that you identified in the literature, the previous studies, how does your research compare or contrast with previous research. So this is a chapter where you bring in the discussion of the literature back into your analysis of the key findings. The conclusions chapter then is where the dissertation is kind of drawing to a close. You look at the key conclusions of the research and the answers to your research question that you can actually develop. Uh, you also consider the theoretical implications of your work, okay, so what does your work in, imply for theory, what does it imply for practice, and what does it imply necessarily for, for practicing managers. And quite related to this uh, section and drawing from that are the recommendations. So for example, what recommendations would you provide for theory? Is, do you think that your research maybe supports existing theory or challenges existing theory? And you have to keep um, make recommendations for three key stakeholders, for um, management uh, practice, for uh, society, wider society, which is particularly important in terms of the age we live in with sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And finally, future research. So what uh, future studies could be done on the basis of uh, what you have found and what gaps do you think still, still exist within the literature. So they are the, the, the key chapters. I think very important as well for all your UEL modules is to consider the marking criteria and this has recently been redesigned and as module leader one of my first things to do was to actually think about how we could redesign this particular process. So students are marked for uh, on the following um, criteria. It's 10% for the introduction and in that introduction chap section it very much considers the uh, research question, the objectives that are framed succinctly, academically, and that they are both valid and relevant. The uh, critical discussion of relevant literature is 25%. And this accounts for looking at the analysis of the literature, the, the key writing, uh, have you analysed the key seminal authors, have, is your review critical, and by critical we mean intellectually engaged, have you done enough research into this topic, do you feel you have a handle on the conversation, so it's critically moderating that conversation. The research methodology then accounts for 15%. So this is the um, designing of a cogent, valid research methodology that can help you to address the research question in a focused way. So that accounts for 15%. Um, a key um, component of the marking scheme is the data analysis and interpretation. And this comprises the majority of the marks, 35% for um, analysis of key patterns in the data, and uh, the, the rigour and the uh, approach which you take will really determine how those 35 marks are apportioned. We then um, design, we, we have 10% for the conclusions and the recommendations of the research and finally 5% for the organisation, presentation and referencing. And I think um, 
Crucially, if you look at the literature review, the uh, methodology and the uh, analysis and interpretation sections, they account for 75% of the marks. So that's a significant proportion of the grade and I think it's useful just to look at the module handbook and to acquaint yourself with exactly how the marks are, uh, are apportioned, what each section should contain and how you will actually um, go about designing your, your, your study. So that's a crucial, uh, a crucial document and a crucial uh, uh, table to consider in your design. Um, so how are you allocated a supervisor? So obviously for this dissertation you will have to work closely with a supervisor and that supervisor will be allocated either through UEL Plus if you're working with a collaborative partner or perhaps with your own institution and you should check with your own institution as to how they allocate supervisors within uh, their own departments. Um, if you have a topic that you're interested in and you know a particular member of staff in your institution who has an interest in that topic, I often advise students to approach those supervisors uh, or potential supervisors early. See them during their student hours, email them, tell them your idea and they will be able to maybe start the dialogue with you about that particular project. And supervisors often provide the first contact after, after they've been allocated. Um, at UEL we sometimes encourage our students to, you know, to start that process of dialogue because sometimes supervisors may, may not be aware initially that they have been allocated. So it can be useful if a, um, if a student uh, makes the first uh, move in that respect and contacts the supervisor. So some of the questions that students often ask is can you begin your research before you meet your supervisor? And the answer to that question is yes. From your proposal you should have written um, you know, before you meet your supervisor, you will have done some research collecting, collecting articles, uh, reading them, designing re potential research questions and you should at that first meeting have an idea of what your topic is going to be, what the structure of your literature review might look like or even better still having some sort of a draft um, of, a, of a literature section or, or just some sort of uh, something for the supervisor to work with. So. Absolutely. Supervisors really like students that are self-starting, that can come to them and say this is my idea rather than waiting for a, a supervisor to provide them with the idea. So that is, is, is really vital. So what role does the supervisor have with your, with your dissertation? Well they are very much there to oversee the dissertation process and to make sure that you are making, um, you are making good progress along the way. They don't necessarily need to be experts in the area. For example, I have supervised dissertation projects in human resource management. As a marketing academic, I don't necessarily have any experience in human resource management um, theory or practice, but I do understand the process of social scientific research. So as a, as a supervisor, I was able to supervise that particular project without necessarily having um, an enormous theoretical grounding in the subject. Um, they are, supervisors are there and students, are, students meet them to, um, you know, to update them on their progress, how their work is progressing, uh, issues or stumbling blocks and talking them through with the supervisor. But this is not, and I think it's important to emphasize this, this is not a process where the student and the supervisor uh, are, are co-creating this work, so to speak. Uh, the this, this student is very much responsible for the thinking, the research, the decisions and the writing. Okay, so really this, this supervisor is there to oversee the process but not to do the work and I think that's a, an important distinction to make. What are the responsibilities of the student in this process? Well, um, first of all is to be proactive and be creative. As I say, most, most supervisors like students who come to them with an idea. So this is what I want to do, here is how I want to go about it, I would like your feedback and your, your uh, your guidance on this particular topic and I think guidance is a key word for supervision. Um, very important for the student to attend meetings, okay. Students receive six hours of contact with an academic face to face and it's very important that students use this time wisely and effectively and um, keep records. On UEL Plus and as part of the dissertation process, students must keep a record 
of the meetings that they have with their supervisors. And supervisors also keep written records. And those written records are not necessarily a monitoring device. They are there so st students can remember the, the, um, the, key, uh, the, the key aspects of the meeting and actually incorporate that feedback into their work. So keeping written records is a really vital part of the process. Um, for students to get the most out of those face-to-face -face sessions, emailing written work in advance is very, very important because the supervisor can have time to read the work, comment upon it, and actually provide suggestions for improvement. So in order to use that time wisely, emailing the, uh, the, the work in advance is very important. S supervisors are only required to, re to re comment upon one draft per chapter. Okay, so. Um, Students should use that time and that, and that draft time particularly, um, particularly wisely. Um, it's the student's responsibility to keep the supervisor updated on his or her progress or issues or problems they may be having. So they should try and keep the student or the supervisor uh, informed of what they are doing. It's very important for the student to produce work that is of good quality, that they believe in, and take control of their own project. So this is about a mature, proactive approach where the student is managing their own project, managing their own process. And finally, Academics are, as I'm sure you can appreciate, busy people and they have their own projects, their own teaching and their other uh, activities that they're engaged in. So it's very important for students to use that time wisely and if they have uh, time with the academic to actually turn up on time, to engage, to, to, to be enthusiastic and to actually get the most out of that particular meeting or interaction that they possibly can. So what are the key reasons for students not doing well or worse still, failing this module? Well firstly, and I would say the reason why it's top is because this happens quite a lot, is if students, do, who, students who have not done well, a key reason is they don't understand that this is a research process, not a 14,000 word project. So they have to kind of, um, in some way, engage with the fact that this is a research process and that they have to... Uh, conduct uh, an analysis of the literature, design a question, design a methodology. Not engaging with the supervisor, so in some ways not actually uh, keeping the supervisor updated on progress, not emailing work, or leaving everything until the last week or the last few days. So this is, uh, you know, th this is not handling your research like a, a, a process. It's more a kind of leaving everything until the, 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 the last few weeks, and that's not advisable. Not being proactive, okay? So not actually, uh, I'm not, uh, not actually kind of taking a lead, expecting the supervisor to drive the research process. This is a student-directed process, and it's the student's responsibility to actually engage with it. Um, not being focused, so not actually, you know, in some ways focusing upon a particular topic, um, not actually being disciplined enough to actually, um, you know, narrow down to a particular area. So that can be problematic. Not following the advice of the supervisor. So the supervisor is there to give you the benefit of their wisdom, okay? And their advice is useful. Obviously, it's always there for the student to, um, to, to take or leave, so to speak. But most supervisors will provide students with advice that's useful, that's relevant, and that has the student's best interests at heart. And students should take the advice in that particular spirit. And crucially as well, some students do not understand the regulations associated with dissertation submission and uh, dissertation uh, allocations or indeed how, how, how dissertations are written for example the format or the structure so these are all uh, common problems that students can anticipate that, sorry that have ha happened to students before and I think it's important just to anticipate these problems and make sure that uh, students don't fall into any of these particular traps in how they develop their work so what is the kind of submission procedure. Well, for students, their first attempt is fully supervised and it's uncapped. So students will receive six hours of face-to-face -face tuition with, a, with individual tuition with a supervisor. They can apportion those six hours as they wish with the supervisor depending upon arrangements within the institution. Um, 
the mark is uncapped, which means it will, whatever the percentage mark allocated is what the work will, will receive. And students only receive one uncapped attempt as, at University of East London. Should the student be unsuccessful with their first submission, they are entitled to one remedial error with the supervisor. And that is it. It's not another set of supervision, it's one remedial error. And the, the, the dissertation is capped at 50% after that. Okay. The third attempt, so such students have two unsuccessful attempts, they must then pay to retake the entire module with a new topic, with a new supervisor and start the process all over again. And again, this, this dissertation will be capped at 50%. So irrespective of how good the third attempt is, it will only ever receive 50. And should a student fail on the third attempt, the fourth attempt is very similar to the second, where the student will receive one remedial error with the supervisor and must then resubmit at the next available opportunity. Again, that dissertation uh, attempt will be capped at 50%. So the dissertation process um, is, begins with a, with a proposal and as you can see from the slides, um, this semester our dissertation proposal was due in November, for next semester it will be in April. So the dissertation proposal will always be due in either November or April, depending upon your timetable and your institutional arrangements. Um, the dissertation proposal tends to be submitted through UEL Plus. It's a document to give us a sense of what your topic is and who is the most appropriate supervisor to allocate you to that particular research. And the dissertation is 100% electronic from this semester. So both the proposal and the dissertation are submitted electronically. We have moved away completely from hard copy submission. So everything can be submitted from the, the comfort of your own home or indeed from your, from, your, um, from your university. So there's no requirement to submit or print out physical hard copies of the work with the exception of maybe your supervisory meetings. So what does a dissertation proposal actually look like? Well this is a 1,500 word overview of the work that you will be doing. So it gives us at the beginning a 200 word overview of the entire project. Okay, So what is this project about? A very, very brief literature review, and I always tell students a brief literature review should maybe analyse 10 key papers that are going to guide your research and help you to uh, focus this particular topic. Um, the proposed research methodology, roughly 400 words outlining how you are going to do this research, what approach you're going to take and what sort of data you're going to work with for this dissertation. The conclusion then should be roughly about 150 words as to what contribution you feel this research will make. And finally, I think it's important to include some sort of a Gantt chart or a, or a timeline as to how you can see yourself using those 12 to 14 weeks and how you're going to time and, 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 and allocate uh, particular blocks of time to this project. And finally, you must include a bibliography, and the bibliography are just the key sources that you're using for your research, and all cited correctly using Cite Them Right, which is the university's academic uh, referencing guide. So advice for writing a proposal is to start with a general topic uh, area or int uh, uh, of interest and uh, conduct an initial literature review. So you begin quite broad, but then you kind of try and narrow down as, as, as you move, move forward. And we'll talk a little bit about how you funnel this process in the research process and philosophy session. Um, you conduct initial literature review, as I say, roughly 10 key papers to get you focused and to understand what the conversation is. You develop what I always tell students is a tentative research question, a broad outline of what you will do and how you will do it. So uh, the most appropriate methodology and the, pro the, the provisional proposal is really the first step. As the Chinese tell us, uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step and for students doing a dissertation, that first step is the proposal. So that gives you a sense of, of what you, you must do. So finally, just to conclude this initial session, this very first session, that the proposal is the crucial first step 
in this process. Okay, so it's really how you begin the, the dissertation, and it's to allocate you with an appropriate supervisor. It should start off quite broad, and you might look at it if if it was a marketing-related topic, you might start off looking at marketing, but it could look at something specific like market orientation, for example. If it was brand management, it could look at brand associations or brand personality. So it actually starts off with a very broad interest in an area and then narrows down to a topic. So in the research process lecture, we're going to look at how you do that as a student. Having theory is absolutely crucial. So there has to be some sort of a theoretical foundation to this work that enables us, uh, us to understand how it's theoretically positioned. Having a research question and related set of objectives is absolutely vital. And those questions and objectives must be framed from and, and linked to your critical engagement with the literature. So what has been written previously and what will be the focus of your work. Finally, you should have an idea of the methodology in the proposal. What sort of approach will you take? What will you do? How will you do it? And providing rationale and justification for why you'll do it in that particular way. And that rationale and justification should be academically underpinned. And finally, I think like any project, you should um, have a very strong visualization of how you will complete this work. So how will you actually go about completing, finishing this project? and uh, what sort of a methodology will you use, and what sort of contribution do you think this research will make. And I think crucially your research should try be something that you're passionate about, something that you're interested in, and something that will help you with your future career. So in this session we've given uh, just an, a very broad overview of the, the, the dissertation, the structure, the, 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 the number of chapters, the number of words per chapter, the number of weeks that you should allocate per project. And we've also given an overview of some of the uh, UEL regulations and, and, and what, what they entail and the dissertation proposal and what that, what that should contain. And I think this uh, lecture is a very, is, is, as a preamble, is very useful to give you an understanding of what's required and how you can get started. So in the next sessions we'll be looking at different aspects and different approaches to the research that should be helpful, but this, this particular session is just a general overview giving you an understanding of the various stages. Thank you.